So we've discussed conflict of interest, but it's often used in the same sentence or same context as bias, but they are two different concepts. What is bias and how does it differ from conflict of interest? Typically when we speak of bias, we speak of, of that term in the context of adjudication, decision making involving the professional privileges, let's say, of uh, a particular individual as opposed to policy making where conflict of interest might arise more directly. Bias is a condition or state of mind that renders or appears to render a decision maker less than open to considering both sides of the case, less than open to being persuaded by both parties as opposed to only one party. And it's been held that bias then is something that renders a decision maker incapable of participating in the decision in a proper and fair way. So your right to an unbiased decision maker is an aspect of procedural fairness in our law. But everyone has an opinion, so how do I know where that opinion is held so strongly or so uh, vehemently that it goes into the area of bias? Well, let me give you an example. Um, there was a case several years ago where a public representative, so a public appointee, said that in her view all complainants should be believed and all physicians should be disbelieved. Now in that case she'd pretty much closed her mind to persuasion by those who were representing physicians charged with uh, professional misconduct relating to complainants. So in that case it could be argued that there was perhaps actual bias, but there was at least a reasonable apprehension of bias. And an important point to be made here about bias is that it doesn't have to be actual bias that is proven in order to disqualify a decision maker. It may be reasonably apprehended bias. And the Supreme Court of Canada has defined that as, as what a reasonable person, having applied their minds to the issue and thought the matter through, would conclude. Would they conclude that this decision maker about whom the allegation is made would not decide the case fairly. So that's a, an overview of bias, particularly as it relates to adjudication. And um, you can see that it ought to disqualify at least the, the member of the board or committee holding the bias or perceived to have the bias from participating in the decision making. Now, one of the things that I've heard people say, though, is, um, yes, I have a strongly held opinion in one way or another, but I can still make a unbiased decision, and so I should be able to take part in this discussion. How do you decide when that's not the case? Well, one of the big lessons here is that you should disclose precisely what you've just said in that situation to people who might be affected by your decision so that they can make an informed choice about whether or not you should continue to participate in the process. And once you do that, once you make that disclosure, then the parties can make that decision about whether to challenge your continued involvement. And it may be that having heard the submission, you choose voluntarily to disqualify yourself, or is it sometimes called recuse yourself? I think it's important to remember that uh, an appearance of bias, of prejudgment, of uh, having a strongly held opinion is only one form of bias that you can have at a hearing and in fact is probably not the most common form. Uh, probably the most common form is having some prior involvement in the matter, having had some involvement in its investigation, having been consulted on the matter, um, or, or something like that. Another form of bias is if you have a connection to a participant. Uh, they might be uh, a competitor in the same mall as you, uh, something like that. Uh, so it's not just having a firm opinion on the, on the issue, which of course is a real concern, uh, but it's, it's also these other things. So it sounds like this goes to the point that when you go to a board meeting or a committee meeting or whatever it is you're trying to do in a self-regulated body, you 
are entitled to have your opinions because we all have opinions and we are humans, but we need to come and still be willing to listen to each side and make a decision based on the discussion, not just on your opinion. Am I characterizing that as incorrectly? I think you're putting it very well because that's really what fairness is. It's being willing to listen to both sides and being seen to be willing to listen to both sides. So if someone is perceived to have their mind made up, not be able to be swayed, is, are the principles the same as they are with conflict of interest, that it should be privately or ultimately if it has to be publicly discussed and brought to the attention of the board as a whole? Is that correct? Well, typically the, the chair of the board or president of the panel, we're talking about a panel of a committee, mm -hmm. should ask all of the members of the committee, let's say, to uh, consider whether or not they have a bias or may be perceived to uh, have a bias in favor of one party. And that will trigger this disclosure process that we've discussed where, where uh, panel members can inform the parties about any potentially disqualifying bias. Uh, the other point I'd make about this, and I'll be interested in Richard's view, is that it's not just at that stage when you have to consider the issue of disqualifying bias. You have to consider it throughout the adjudicative process, right up to the point of decision. Because it may be that you acquire some information about the case that causes you to realize that in fact it may appear to others that you have a bias. Typically, for example, in a hearing, you don't know who all the witnesses are. And it may occur that, that a witness is called partway through the hearing and you realize that that's someone you knew from years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the parties have a right to know that. I agree. The fundamental point of a hearing is that until the last witness has been called and the last legal argument or submission made, the tribunal has to be absolutely neutral uh, and impartial, and they have to, in their behavior, have demonstrated that. Uh, it could be that once part of a case is, is held, um, you start to lean towards one side or the other. And if you allow that to snowball into conduct that, you know, rolling eyes when a witness is testifying or, or snickering or something, uh, then you've dememonstrated uh, the appearance uh, that is going to get the panel into trouble. So if there is bias discovered part way through, is that just the time to recuse yourself? Is that too late? Well, that's the time to rec recuse yourself. Uh, but it may be appropriate to seek advice of independent legal counsel the second to the trickier. committee <laughs> because the second question is what of the other members of the committee? Do they have to disqualify themselves as well? And um, you'll have to hear submissions from the parties on that issue and uh, not surprisingly the party who feels that uh, he or she has been losing the hearing up to that point may well argue in favor of disqualifying the entire committee. So sometimes uh, if it's just a matter of one person having a connection to a witness, that can hardly taint the rest of the panel. But if, it's, uh, if the bias is a, a demonstration of, of prejudgment by one member of the panel, that can, that can possibly taint the whole panel and, and so you need to be extra careful there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Now you have some of the concepts that you need to be an effective board or committee member. Think about these concepts when you're at your next meeting. Ask questions. Watch the video again. And if you need more information, feel free to give us a call. Thanks again, and good luck.